Yeah, um, I've just been asked about the Mark Rothko connection. Um, when John Selway was a student at the Royal College, that's 1959 to 62, um, the Royal College would have had various visiting tutors. Incidentally, another one would have been Kerry Richards, so there's another Welsh connection for you, but one of the visiting tutors was Mark Rothko. So, yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, just being asked, what do I think about Newport Art College now? The, the studio that Zaboli and Elias produced their work in was known as the Plumbing Shop, and it was in Clarence Place, that's the actual premises, which were custom-built. They've got these beautiful top lights. It's, I think the building, again, is about 100 years old, around about 1910, 12, 13. And it, it was sort of closed eventually. I remember doing some teaching there in the 80s. It closed and they transferred all the kind of art provision from the center of Newport up to Kyle Leon. Um, again, what goes round comes round, doesn't it? Because in the, in recently, Newport, um, the art college, and they've now merged with us, so we've, we've become a bigger group. But they've, they've moved back from Kyle Leon to the other side of the river. But in the interim, which is what the questioner was asking, was the original Clarence Place building where, you know, pop was being produced. Um, that's become residential, which seems a shame because it was a custom-built building. Um, I was being asked why that um, the Elias isn't in the shop as a postcard. Well, it's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to become a postcard. Um, I don't quite know how it came about, but the museum has chosen that image to sort of represent the exhibition. So, you know, a, p a piece done in his final year as a student, which I helped him rescue from his attic. Um, he, he'd had it rolled up since the 60s. He finished it in 1969, and um, yeah, we, we sort of resurrected it. So I think again, you know, kind of pop art and the Welsh connection is only, it's really only now. I mean, what I've told you today is brand new, and it's going beyond, I was making connections there that aren't just in the books that I was referring to. And this exhibition really is cutting edge in that sense. Yes, pop has been around now for 40 years, but the kind of Welsh dimension to international movements of art is only now and in the last year or two being really looked at by this National Museum. So I think it's a very exciting time that we are thinking again about ourselves, our artists, and our lifetimes, really. I've forgotten. I can't remember. <laughs> um, I think it's perhaps, uh, yeah, 15 or something. Yeah. So did anyone else have any questions? Tim. Carrie, you mentioned the significance of Ken's local cinema where he's largely uh, worked yeah. and its profits. I remember going with Ken many years ago prior to an exhibition to see the cinema in a state of dereliction. Is it still standing or has it been converted right. to something? Um, I was being asked about the cinema that Ken used to visit as a boy. Sadly, the cinema got demolished two or three years ago, or perhaps it's four or five now. Um, it was built in the 1930s with the miners' pennies, which is another aspect you know, about this social mobility. The, the, the coal miners of South Wales built all these kind of community centres, as we might call them now, often in the 1930s, although there are phases in the Rhondda because the coal there was of a different type. The, the, the Rhondda institutions are earlier, but in the sort of western end of the coalfield where Elias is from, it's the 1930s, which was the anthracite part. The anthracite, I'm getting technical here now, but anthracite coal um, became more valued later on, so there's a different phase. But, but across the South Wales Valleys between sort of 19, we'll say 1890 and 1935-40, you have these institutes being, being built. So it began as a miners' institute, and then built in 1933, I think, 
and it survived till, well, it, it just about made 100. It was certainly there in 2003. Now, that's not 30, 70 years, 70 years. It survived 70 years. I mean, those kind of institutions would have helped people develop their thinking and ideas. Um, Zaboli in the Ronda, you know, was very close to p perhaps the most famous of those institutes, the Park and Dare, which again is about 100 years old now, the, the, the main building. And of course in there, you know, they will be dis debating philosophy, politics, contemporary culture, there would be art classes. So there's quite a tradition, and maybe something that's come across in my talk is, is, is this notion also that the valleys, just as the valleys fed this coastal cities of Cardiff, Swansea, and Newport with coal. In a way, the valleys also fed Cardiff, Swansea, and Newport with, with artists. So, you know, the South Wales story is a story that happens both sides of the M4, okay? North of the M4 in South Wales and south of the M4, and both parts are necessary. You know, the, the main institutions, this one, is south of that line, but, you know, our culture doesn't fully note that division of the M4. You know, it is kind of permeable. It's back to this idea of doorway. There, there is movement across. Sorry, it's probably a whole new lecture, but you mentioned the subtext in the Yes. Could you say Okay, yes, yes. Yeah, the subtext. Um, I mean, Larkin's poem has a kind of subtext. I mean, in Ken's case, the subtext is to do with sexuality, because the 60s, I mean, if we wanted to mention um, what happens in the 60s, in 1967, we have a Scottish MP who um, pushes through the Abortion Act, or the anti-abortion um, position. That was the Scottish MP, David Steele. In the same year, um, Leo Absey is pushing through, I think it was called sexual... Orientation. Sexual Orientation Act, I'm not quite sure. But again, it was, it was really ending the ban on homosexuality as well. So that's the kind of subtext that is informing that piece. So this is a kind of a, a, a period, you know, the 60s is, is, is that period of change. I, mean, I haven't really touched on the, the kind of music aspect of the period as well, this kind of sexual liberation for men and women. Um, but one of Zaboli's contemporaries on that train traveling down, who became a member of the Ronda group, um, who is still alive and lives in Panath, is Charles Burton. And he went on to teach at Liverpool. So again, it's, it's another kind of dispersal from the valleys. Burton was from the top of the Ronda. And one of his pupils at Liverpool was John Lennon. You know, so there's quite a strong link between the kind of music and, and art world there. Um, another member of the Ronda group, Robert Thomas, the sculptor, um, he then went to teach in London at Ealing, and one of his pupils was Pete Townsend, who's at that point, I mean, no one really knows that, but he's quite a gifted sculptor. So um, the kind of emergence of the kind of pop scene in music as well as kind of alternative sexualities or degrees of um, liberation. You know, I mean, is it a, how much of a coincidence is it that the miniskirt um, emerges really with the advent of the pill and that whole kind of change? So, you know, th there's lots of other ways of reading this material. Pardon? <laughs> um, I was asked, did they paint portraits? Uh, yes. Yes, they all did. Um, Ken, because you know he goes to the cinema. I don't know if any of you have seen the film Cinema Paradiso, but I, I've made the analogy between that. In the film Cinema Paradiso, you have this small boy who is captivated by the magic of the screen, and you have the character of Alfredo, who's the projectionist. You know, in Ken's case, he is that small boy, but now not in Italy, not in Italy, Tim, but in Wales, um, and the equivalent of Alfredo the Projectionist is his auntie, the Usherette. So his portraits are of the film stars. 
So he just portraits generally, I mean, one or two of his parents, but, but it's film stars. Zaboli does self-portraits um, so that the figure is contained. And I, I talked earlier about the motif of the doorway. Zaboli's trajectory is very complex, um, and he returns to the motif of the doorway via various filmmakers, incidentally, and writers. And often he has a figure or a portrait in a door. He's making some deep philosophical points about, you know, these idea of thresholds. I mean, again, in Margaret Thatcher's funeral, the, the bishop said about how she was also one of us. And, you know, this idea that we all make, you know, we all make that transition. So, you know, this doorway, it's an entrance, you know, we came into the world, but it's also, it's also an exit, isn't it? So, um, Zaboli is quite kind of, com he's complex when his portraits go beyond that and they're about that kind of idea of the human condition. So on one level, they're based on figures in doorways, literally, because I'm just old enough to remember as a small child got being taken to the Ronda and seeing particularly men standing in doors. I remember asking my parents, why were they, and my grandparents, why were they doing that? Often they would be minors standing in the door, and the reason for standing was because they were having difficulty breathing. Or sometimes it would be the housewife on the door who'd be talking to a neighbour. You know, this is pre us, our atomised world. You know, most people didn't have television, they would have had radio, but there was more kind of socialising. <coughs> it's more Italianate in a way, <laughs> in that sense. So, you know, figures in doorways are something that was observed, particularly in terraced housing in, in the valleys. But Zaboli takes that motif of the portrait, you know, the figure, and really starts to think about, you know, what is a picture, what is a life, what is the human condition. In the case of Dennis, Dennis, I mean, I've you know, written on Zaboli and Elias. Dennis, I've known a little bit and then corresponding with him. I don't know enough about him. Certainly his wife, Arianne, does portraits. And Dennis has. Um, I can't really tell you uh, uh, the sort of the thinking behind that aspect of his work. But he does touch on it. And in a sense, this is a kind of portrait, isn't it? Even though there's no figure there, you know, it's a life-sized door. I mean, that, I think that's an important point to make. You know, just as Zaboli's chair is big enough to sit in it, was big enough for the dog. You know, this is big enough to walk through. Um, and Dennis Short did make some of these where they are interactive, so you, you were actually allowed to move through them. So I think that's important. This, this is actual size, which maybe is why we, or well, certainly I'm so captivated by it. I mean, so it explains the slippers. You know, because the door's life size, then the slippers are. I'm dying to. <laughs> I don't know if you can pick them up. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I don't know, Kerry, whether it's worth mentioning that the door is open. Yes. And the Barry's door. Um, the Barry's houses are very close together and they don't necessarily want to be out in the street. But by having a door open, it's a welcoming thing. And the fact that you've got a curtain at the front frequently did, people did leave their front doors open and they had yes. a certain, as that is, partly open. So that it's basically an open invitation saying, welcome, we're open. But people didn't always want to go out into the street, so the houses there wouldn't have had front gardens. They may have had small back gardens, and that'd be about it. I think it was just open yeah. community. I think, I think you're quite right. I mean, aesthetically, but also sort of philosophically, yeah, the fact that the door is half open. It's a, well, is it half open or half closed? Do you know what I mean? We're back there again. But, it, you know, it tantalises us and it invites us. Yeah, so there's, there's a potential, isn't there, with the door? You know, if it was fully open or fully closed, it's more interesting, isn't it, that it's half, half and half. But you're right, I mean, people in the valleys, you know, it wasn't a cliche, it really did happen. Um, people didn't lock their houses. You could go in and out. <coughs> um, well, at the University of Glamorgan, we have uh, some of his work. The, the museum has some other work by him. I don't think there's much of 
Elias's work on display. Um, in the university, we've got a whole Zaboli room, so we've got a permanent room displaying his work. I mean, this is one of the problems for even a national institution like this, or ourselves as a university, um, is we've got so much, you know, so many stories to tell, as I've been telling you one today, and so much to display. And, you know, we need more. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? But we do, we really do need more writing, more exhibiting, more space. We, yeah, there's so much out there, and there's so many stories that I would like to tell you about, and other people do as well. But it occurs to me because of the effect of nature you were in it. The person you're looking at it, it becomes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this was billed as a half hour talk, and um, those of you that have heard me talk before will know that I can, I, I can do that, and I did, but I, I, I would always want to say more. And one of the things I did omit, thank you very much, is because, of course, it's shiny metal, then all of us are potentially in it. And again, the idea of the mobility, you know, as we move, that those reflections change. So I think that's a very important part, and the light, yeah? So yes, I, you know, I mean, Dennis subsequently has done work using sort of shiny metal. <laughs> so yeah, it is another dynamic, and there's a, that whole tradition. And I, I briefly talked about this in terms of sculpture. You know, the kind of traditional sculpture would be a bronze, and it would be figurative, or organic. If you think of, say, Henry Moore, you still have the organic shape. And then you have the next generation, same kind of age group as Dennis, Anthony Caro, who's still alive and working. And what does Anthony Caro do? Again, think of the, the works we've been looking at. He, he eliminates the curve, and you have the rectilinear. And he paints some of those sculptures of his, you know, often girders or girder-like material. He paints them in those bright colors. So again, there is a shift. You know, so the, you know, it's interesting to look at kind of post-war British sculpture um, and how you have in this case, rectilinearity and new materials. You know, so that, that is a shift, and certainly away from bronze. So you know, this, this really is a major piece. I'm quite envious I, that the museum has it. It would be lovely to have one of, one of these pieces in the university. Yes, it's a kind of memento. There's a memento mori aspect, isn't there, of this ref framing ourselves. You know, and you, I'm standing here now, and I frame myself, and I suddenly thought, I've got to move, otherwise I've been, you know, it's like the fly caught in the amber. It's okay for a minute, but then you want to move. Is it hard to get in with you? Pardon? With this? I, I don't know about the technical <laughs> side. Um, I don't know what the substructure is. And I don't know if you know Nick. Yeah, it's soft wood. I suspect it'll be wood. It's yeah, a wooden it's substructure. Soft wood, soft structure yeah. Is it glued or? Yes, it's glued. Right. With, uh, sort of, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the like, Evo stick type glue. So it's the, the, most of the metal structures are glued onto the, onto the wooden substructure. So although it's very polished from the surface, it's actually, if you look inside it, it's got a real lovely handmade quality to it as well. So it's, Literally made in the shed from materials to hand. So it's and again, yeah, it's interesting hearing Nick say that because Dennis, as I said, who's now in his 80s, but in the 1980s, when he was only in his 50s, um, he started a whole series of bird tables. You know, so you know he's obviously working with other materials. I, I suspected it was wood inside, but it's nice to know that it really is. Um, yeah, so there you are, it is glued.